Hey, say, uh, or I think it's our 17th, based on a quick count, Corgonine uh, monthly webinar. And uh, really grateful to have had Nick Boucher lead us through these 17. And uh, one of the sad things about today is it's going to be like Nick's last time, I believe, doing the all of the important work, uh, not only before the webinar, but also during the webinar. And we're really going to miss him. And hopefully he'll still join in uh, just to watch them. Um, but if everybody could give sort of a virtual round of applause for Nick and all of the great work he's done. Um, he's going to be um, leaving the commission I think by the time our next uh, Corrigoni webinar happens. Is that true, Nick? Uh, yes, I, I may be uh, sort of transitioning power at that point, but yes, I'll probably be gone in my current role. So thanks, Bo. Okay, well, really appreciate it. This wouldn't happen without you. Um, so we're grateful for that support from the commission and what you've done specifically. Our next webinar is actually January 6th. Uh, I don't know if Jory Jonas and Ben Tershak are with us today or not. I haven't looked at the participation participant list, um, but yeah, we will be advertising that soon. It's going to be on uh, Cisco, so Corrigan and Sartetti, Trophic Ecology in Lake Michigan. Talking about some of the interesting findings they found through stomach contents and through stable isotopes. So that's going to be another great talk. Um, Anything else to add if either Joy or Ben is on, if they want to flip their camera on real quick? Maybe we don't have them today. So we'll get that advertised and you, when you can register for that. Today, we are here to uh, hear an update on a talk that was actually given at the Joint Aquatic Sciences meeting in Grand Rapids back in May. And it was one of the best talks I've ever seen at a meeting. It was it was recorded, um, and now we're going to get the live version with it. I think a few updates from it, but it they're going to provide some really interesting findings. Owen Gorman and Amanda Ackes, both from the USGS Great Lake Science Center, about describing the the Lake Superior Cisco Deepwater Cisco complex using morphology and genetics. So Owen got his bachelor's degree from University of Delaware his master's from Purdue University, and his PhD from the University of Kansas. Uh, he started working for the federal government in 1990 with Fish and Wildlife Service, and then transitioned to his current position at the Great Lakes Science Center, uh, Lake Superior Biological Station in Ashland, Wisconsin in 1999. So, um, and then with Owen, we'll be presenting, uh, co-presenting Amanda Ackes, uh, Amanda has been at the USGS Great Lakes Science Center since 2020. Um, she's uh, got her bachelor's at the University of Virginia and her PhD at Old Dominion University. And um, I've, it's been a real delight to work with uh, Amanda just down the hall from me uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I think you're going to start us off, Owen. Is yes. that correct? <clears throat> Okay. All right. Um, the, the title's a little different than the uh, JASM meeting, uh, Resolving Morphologic and Genetic Variation in the Lake Superior Cisco Complex. That's our goal. Um, and I want to point out our collaborators at the very beginning here that this work would not be possible without them. Joshua Lyons, who's now off to graduate school at University of Windsor and Rop. Um, who is at the Great Lakes Science Center and uh, sort of the right-hand person in Amanda's lab, Yu Chun Kao, who recently left um, the Great Lakes Science Center, is now working with Fish and Wildlife Service, Renee Renauer and uh, Vinny Siegel are both at the Great Lakes Science Center and Tom Pratt um, with DFO, our Canadian partner. And um, he, was just, he was a rather essential part of this project as point out that um, the original goal of the project was to conduct a lot of field sampling, but the timing of the project was it started essentially when COVID-19 began. 
And so there was a, a different approach to how we were going to get samples. So um, Tom provided a number of samples from the mid early 2000s um, for this study. So going back to the beginning, um, for all of us that work with Cisco's, um, we have to go back to Walter Kelt's 1927 monograph, um, where he described all of these uh, Cisco's of the Great Lakes. Uh, and I, I'm always finding myself going back to this volume. Um, this is the person that started this all, and we're still trying to wrap our heads around what did Walter Kelt see out there. Um, and, you know, I said, I have in there, like it or not, ecclesiologists since the publication of Kelt's monograph have been searching for his described forms. Some have been suspicious about their, exi exist their existence and his descriptions. Um, we won't get into any of that. Um, I keep finding myself, when I look at these, uh, these fish, realizing anyone that does this is how difficult it is to try to make sense out of what's there. And he has given us a lot of information to start and um, he keeps somehow vindicating himself as we continue to go forward in our research. Um, our rationale here is that uh, Cisco's were once the dominant component of the Great Lakes fish communities um, and only Lake Superior has an intact assemblage. And of course, this has become the kind of purpose for the Corrigan Restoration Initiative is to find ways to restore this assemblage of Cisco's in the lower lakes. These fish are very challenging to identify in the field or lab, even with experienced people. Um, I always find it interesting when we go back out in the spring and start seeing these fish after not having seen them for six months and they come out on the table and once again, um, you go through a little learning curve. Um, so even those who have seen tens of thousands of these um, still get uh, confused when you take a look at them. Our goal is to better understand the diversity of Cisco forms in Lake Superior and provide guidance for identification by researchers and managers. That's always a goal is to try to help people see that diversity that's out there. And this work really, another important work that uh, that we are building on is the monograph published by Eschenroder et al. 2016. So, um, you know, that, that's an important piece of work. And so we build on that as well. On the shoulders of that and Kelts, we move forward. So moving on to the diversity of Lake Superior Cisco's, um, we have the common forms, the Cisco, Artidae, Loader, Hoyai, Kaiai, Kaiai. Um, and here's just an example of them laid out on our sorting table on our research vessel, the RV Kai. Um, I hope when you look at these, you can see the dis how much Kai stick out and Cisco stick out, but then in between you've got this sort of intermediate thing called bloater. Um, and we have rare forms, um, short jaw, the short nose, the black fin and deep body. And I have question marks on those because we're not really sure if they, you know, going into this, do these really exist? Um, and are they morphologically and genetically distinct? So as I, I'm going to do one thing different than at the JASM talk is I'm gonna show you pictures of these fish. So it gives you a sense of what we're dealing with. And I, you know, we have a, a pretty amazing assortment of fish to see. So first would be Artidae. Um, this long uh, sort of missile-like fish. It's a pelagic form. Um, and you can even see that body shape um, in the in yearlings as well. Um, and then when you look at bloater and <clears throat> you know, bloater are different, they're typically smaller. I was gonna say that the artidae um, can achieve as adults, very large size, 350 to 450 millimeters total length. And, um, and are characterized as it, when, uh, maybe I, I don't know if I can go backwards here. Yeah, they're characterized by very short paired fins. Um, they have, like I mentioned, an elongate body and um, relative eye size is small and the relative length of the gill rakers is long and numerous. Um, and typically when they're on the table as in adult forms, they're pretty easy to pick out. Um, 
when we get to the rest of the Cisco's, these are all will fall under the category of deep water Cisco's, meaning that um, their body is not as elongate. And here you can see the effects of decompression on bloater when they come up through so their expanded swim bladders. Um, they're caught at greater depth. Um, here's a picture here of a juvenile who, when you put this side by side with a, uh, a juvenile, I mean, a yearling herring or Cisco, you can see them quite quite distinctly different, at least in this example, but try that when you get a thousand of them sitting on a sorting table. Um, <clears throat> their paired fin lengths are relatively long. Their gill rakers are medium in length. And then Kai, um, this is the, the, stands out as a relatively small fish. Few, few Kai get bigger than 250 millimeters total length. Um, very large eye, short gill rakers, long paired fins. And I have to the right, just so people know, the sort of classic um, extended mandible <clears throat> is what is typically thought of with chi eye in the lower right. And, but you can see moving up to the, the upper of that tree, trio is what I would call a, a, short, a short jawed chi eye. It has an angled premaxillary and a shorter snout than the one at the bottom. So there is some variation in head morphology, even within forms. And when we come to short jaw cisco, um, typically what happens is um, these fish show up on the sorting table and you look at the fish and you go, well, gee, it's not, a, it's, it's big. Um, it's not a bloater. Um, the fins are too short. The gill rakers don't seem long enough. Um, and they, that kind of sort of fits in this sort of a, becomes a new garbage can where it just doesn't seem to be a good bloater. So you could just be a short jaw. Um, and so here's some examples of, of short jaws that have been identified on the sorting table. And to get a closer look at one of these, like here's an example, they typically can get very big. This is a 360 millimeter total length short jaw uh, from Whitefish Bay. And although it doesn't have the angled premaxillary, looking at the gill rakers, you can see uh, they're relatively short in this fish. So this clearly would say, I am not a bloater. <laughs> so you would not see gill rakers that short on a bloater. Then there's the short nose Cisco, which is sort of the mystery fish that's been out there. Um, and we've probably been calling these uh, Zenithicus over the years when we catch them. Um, and the one thing that makes them stand out from Zenithicus is they have very short gill rakers and very low gill raker counts. It, it's the next step beyond that would be a whitefish, except they don't have the thickness, the gill rakers don't have that sort of thickness and robustness of a, of a whitefish. Um, so one look inside the mouth and you know you're looking at something very different. We started, this is an example of a rigard eye that I saw in 2010 on the upper. Um, and we've caught fish at this location in the Keweenaw Bay since then. Um, some of those were genetically characterized. And then there is an example of what we call a negripinus, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, right now, for example, what we've been calling black fin ciscos, looking at all these pictures that we have, these are really big, fish, typically over 300 millimeters, a, a big chunk, th over 300 millimeters total length. They have a lot of pigment. Um, they have their fit, paired fins are shorter than what you would expect with the bloater. Um, and so they get sort of thought, could these be negripinous? And a good example here is comparing, here's a negri negripinous lower here. Um, so this, this is a, a rather large animal, probably on the order of 350 millimeters total length. Um, so they're not small and they have this typical football shape where they get big. Um, and above that are two sort of deep, two sort of albus type uh, artidae. And then well, the other thing that we've seen, um, and this is just another, we call it the deep bodied Cisco. Um, which we see as some sort of a variant of artidae. So the arrow points to these two, two forms where they have a, um, you know, here to the upper right, you can see classical Cisco and the upper fish. Below that is this deep bodied or deep bodied form with a shorter body, not as elongate. 
um, shorter fins. Uh, and so they, they stand out as well. And these are often caught in, in deeper water locations. And then of course, we have fish that just confound us. We're not really sure what they are. Um, so the upper right fish probably is a bloater, um, but it has re really short pelvic fins. The bottom fish has more like a bloater face, but really short gill rakers, but it also has uh, relatively short paired fins. So we'll move on to methodology and we'll begin first with morphometrics. And when I get through that, I'll turn it over to Amanda to give us a brief overview of the genetics. So we began with Kelsa's descriptions and morphometric measures as our starting point to understand the diversity of these forms. You want to look at these through the eyes of Kelts. What did Kelts see? Um, let us stand back and let those characters speak to us. Um, <clears throat> and there's a note here that Kelts really is only addressing adult uh, life stages in his work. Um, that makes things a lot easier, but as everyone knows, when you're out in the field, a lot of times you're, most of the fish you're dealing with depending on the, when there's been some reproduction, some recruitment are juvenile forms. And they just don't match the characteristics that we'd expect with adults. We do include in this study, um, all life stages uh, from age one on up to adults, uh, but to, in order to be consistent with CELTS, our morphometric work will at this stage uh, address just the adult forms. So that again, we're doing things uh, following in the footsteps of Kelts. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice again, far left is a, is a diagram of the morphological characters that are measured by Kelts. Um, and then these, these two diagrams here, the middle one here is, was redrawn from Kelts, um, showing head, sort of head shots of these fish to get some idea of premaxillary angles of, of, uh, uh, in the snout. And then also relative um, lengths and counts, density of gill rakers in the different forms. So we used a three, three approaches to describing morphology to provide a more clear cut approach to identification. So there's, there's a lot of duplication in this. Some of this is to sort of capture errors uh, that we might have. Um, we start out first with laboratory workup. Each fish was identified by two persons. Um, they never relied on one person to make the identification. Each fish is weighed and measured, and Kelts' characters were measured by hand. Not all of them, but a, a major set of those that need to be measured by hand uh, rather than from digital images to, re to get around problems of distortion. So that basically is, means all the head characters have to be measured by hand. Um, selected fish were photographed in a subset were then subjected to a Cisco scorecard identification I'll talk about next. Um, once we get all that done, the fish were all, you know, the, this select, these selected fish were dissected, sexed, and tissues uh, were harvested from them. The Cisco scorecard is a formalized record of identification based on Kelts' characters, and these would be his key diagnostic characters. And again, this is conducted by, by two persons that must have concurrence on, on these measurements and also by their conclusions. And it includes a confirmation score. Um, we often keep slipping, calling it a, a, uh, a sort of confidence score, but it's really con confirmation to Kelts's ideal uh, for each of those characters for that particular form. And then those individual characters are weighted and then added up to create a score. And um, when a fish hits all, all the balls out of the park, it gets this very high score as the, sort of the archetype example of that form. Then we did morphological measures uh, using uh, photographic digital images using the Sigma Scan Pro software. And these measures build on Kelts' measures, but um, we provide a more, they also provide a more dis detailed description of the fish because we added a number of other uh, characters that are measured. And then for post processing, all length based characters for ratios are corrected for allometry. And heuristic characters such as counts, gill rakers are not corrected. And as I mentioned before, we're not going to address in this presentation ontogeny, although if someone has a question and we have time at the end, I do have some slides that show how these characters change from, from, uh, from juvenile life stages to adult life stages, and that's pretty amazing. 
Um, more of a metric analysis, we're not diving into this, this is just to look at this. We measured 46 characters and it includes 16 more than used by Celts and Eschenroder. So we, again, we take the measures that were used by Celts, added those done by Eschenroder, and then we added some more to that. So there's a, a complete suite of these characters that, um, that we've incorporated into our morphological analysis. The Cisco scorecard um, is basically starts out with this card and with a table. And for each fish, you basically score it, how well it fits. Um, these particular forms, Artidae, Necrypinus, Chiae, Hoiae, Zenithicus, and Rigardae. Um, if the fish falls out, clearly as a Chiae, all your check marks and scores are going to wind up in the appropriate columns. It also helps you identify which forms um, are, is the particular fish seen most similar to or could be confused with. And um, there's a number of measurements that are taken that uh, basically capture a subset of Celsus characters that are typically the diagnostic characters for those fish. And just for, for reference sake, these, these diagrams of head shape, body shape, relative fin lengths, and the gill rakers are there so that you can look at them for each individual fish and make marks on the page. So we did, that says there's five, 853 fish were processed um, using the Cisco scorecard. And actually, I think that number's higher because that didn't include um, the fish that uh, Tom Pratt gave us. So there was 81 more fish that were added to that since this presentation was made previously. The morphometric measures done with digital images. So this is an example of one of the uh, frameworks that are uh, placed over a fish. Um, and um, we did 1,795 fish were analyzed. And again, that number would have to go up by a number, number 81 because we, we completed that also with Tom Pratt's fish. And then in a separate analysis um, using digital images, we processed over more than 3,000 gill rakers uh, from fish to look at that. So at this point, I'll turn over methods to Amanda who will explain that aspect, magical aspect of this research. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Owen. So the other component to this project when it was developed was to use genetics to provide identifications and to have that baseline to compare to how well the scorecards are working and where there might be um, particular characters that could be more informative or less informative. And when this project was first uh, designed, the original intent was actually to use a little bit higher power of an approach, use RADSeq. Um, however, RADSeq requires really, really nice quality input DNA to, to work well. And what we found is there was this wonderful subset of fishes that, you know, Owen has to work with that were frozen so that the morphology could, could be completed on them. So we ended up with a lot of really degraded DNA. Uh, at the end of my postdoc, um, I actually developed a GTSeq panel um, or genotyping by sequencing in thousands panel. And it's essentially a way of sort of massively multiplexing PCR to target um, you know, hundreds or even thousands of loci that are informative for telling things apart. And it works a lot better on, on degraded DNA. And so uh, the other perk of that is that it, it's, it's a lot cheaper. So <laughs> we ended up going from um, considering doing a, a more high powered approach on around 500 fish um, to using a, a much cheaper approach that could work on degraded DNA. And we ended up getting about three times as much um, samples that we could process that way using GTSeq. Um, and so what we have is a, a shared um, database that we can use to compare what our genotypes look like to what Owen and his team have um, come up with with morphology to try and better understand the diversity that we're seeing in Lake Superior. Now I'll pass it back to you, Owen. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I just just that. Uh, tack on to there that part of the reason for the, the blessing of having GTSeq is that, um, again, I mentioned we were using samples of opportunity. So we we're mining our freezers a lot. Um, and some of the many of the samples that came from uh, uh, Grand Island, Michigan, which is off Grand Marais, Michigan, um, these fish were pretty decomposed. Um, and so they were not easy to work with. So again, all this opportunity, this, this was a blessing. And we're really happy to see that 
we got such a high yield um, with this process. Um, so we're hoping in the future to use have fresh samples that will not be degraded. So we'll be collecting tissue samples from fresh fish, um, which was an initial goal of this research. The other thing is that while we did genotype over 1400 fish, we're not gonna present the results of only a subset of that. That includes unknowns and juvenile and age one life forms, um, which will be essential in understanding other aspects of research beyond this. So once again, we're just gonna focus on what story the adults are telling us. So we'll go to results for the first part. I'll do that on morphology. And um, again, this note here is just in case I didn't mention this about our this sort of caveat that this is the best we could do under the circumstances. And I, I'm really happy that we were able to overcome many obstacles and still have lots of interesting information um, to, uh, to show you. It's perhaps a, a, an example of nothing could stop us from trying to find a way to get this information and move forward. So the first set um, of diagrams I'm gonna show you are box and whisker plots of um, morphometrics um, the, on individual characters. We're starting here with a paired thin length. And these are gonna be used, um, the first series I'll point out, these are from Cisco Scorecard. Um, and uh, so these are, this is a smaller subset of, of fish uh, which were analyzed. And, <clears throat> and the other thing is just so you orient with these box and whisker plots, um, what's shown here in the box, the line in the middle, but somewhat in the middle of the box, depends on the box, is the median. And then you get the first, the upper and lower quartiles from that median, um, and then the range of observations. So we look at pectoral fin length, um, orienting you from the left, and we're going to use the same color scheme throughout the whole presentation. Red is is artidae, uh, yellow is hoyi, blue is chi, black fin is um, green. That's nigripinus. The short nose rigardi is orange. Short jaw purple. UNID, we're not really going to look at UNID, that's a subject for another day. And then this deep bodied Cisco. And as you can see, relative pectoral fin length is longest in the chi and shortest in artidae, um, somewhat long in bloaters, and typically shorter in um, the other deep water Cisco's. Um, if we look at the uh, relative pelvic fin length, we get a similar story, a little bit different. Um, but the same kind of trend, we get longer paired, longer fins moving from artidae to chi, the first three forms, and the black fin, short nose, and short jaw are somewhat intermediate. Um, and the deep body is, is relatively short and matches more closely with pelvic fin length with artidae. Looking at, um, in this case, we're going to look at uh, relative eye size on the, on the left panel. And this is. Um, this is going to, what we see is Artidae has the smallest relative eye size as adults and Chi with the largest. And I think when you think back about those pictures I showed you of the forms, that seems pretty obvious when you're looking at the fish. So this shouldn't come as any surprise. Hoi have relatively large eyes, but not nearly as, per, as perceptibly large as um, Chi. The other deep water Cisco's have smaller relative eye sizes. We look at relative head length. Um, the the artidae, um, the Cisco has the shortest relative head length when we're looking at this versus body size. So you know this is an example of a product of being an elongate fish and having a very different body form than the other fish, which are behaving more like you know essentially what we think of as deep water Cisco's, a chub. Um, <clears throat> now looking at gill raker lengths in adults. And again, we'll see on the left that the, the maximum gill raker length is longest in artidae, intermediate for hoi, short for chi and rigardi, but the shortest is in rigardi. Um, the black fin has gill raker lengths are relatively long, um, more in, this, in the range of artidae. And then the short jaw is intermediate, mostly overlaps with bloater. Then looking at total gill raker count, um, we see again a sort of somewhat similar pattern. Um, 
the highest killraker counts are in Artidae, and as you move down to Poyot, Poyai, the, the counts get lower, the killrakers are more coarse, with the fewest, lowest counts in Rigardae, and the Negripinus, Zinificus, and the deep water are, are somewhat, deep, deep water Cisco are somewhat intermediate. So we look at a um, PCA of the morphometrics from the scorecard, um, we get these four distinct groups that fall out. Um, and um, what I don't have a circle around is uh, short jaw Cisco, because in this case, it seems to be completely confounded with short nose. Um, we could draw a circle around both of them, uh, but they, a number of those short jaws don't fit it within the, the, the main cluster of what we're calling short jaws, short nose, excuse me. Um, so again, so this is just looking at how they fall out morph morphometrically. You'll see a lot of overlap here when you're looking at a PCA with chi -I, but remember when we do these kinds of analyses, these characters are not weighted. And literally you can have one character, uh, morphological character that just kicks it out of the park. And PCA knows nothing about that. Um, what makes something a chi -I and not a chi -I. So. Um, it's not, we're, we, we were not surprised that you're going to get some chi either and bloater that have some overlapping uh, morphology. Now, when we take, throw everything into the bin from all these, the large and a larger analysis, larger sample size um, using, um, based on the, not from the scorecard, but from the digital measurements. So we're getting a lot more characters involved in this. Um, we see the same three groups um, and Rigardite pulls out pretty nice and you'll see a lot of purple dots mixed in, but those purple dots, which are Zenificus are all over the place. Um, they're up into bloater, mostly mixed in with bloaters. So, um, so there's a group of them. You can kind of see a group up, up there and then there's sort of a, sort of a gap and then there's a, a group of Zenificus dots, the purple dots down here, more mixed in with the, uh, with a short nose. So we'll go to genetics. Okay, so Owen's going to be driving the car here. So Owen, I'll just tell you when uh, forwarding the the slide will be convenient. But um, uh, it's really nice to sort of back up uh, the results that Owen's showing you from morphology with the results we see with the GTC panel. So with genetics of a variety of different flavors, um, previous work with RADSeq um, and with the GTSeq panel, other work from um, scientists that will be coming out shortly with whole genome data, we see very clearly um, the uh, most common species in Lake Superior, Chi I, Bloater, Cisco, cluster out very nicely. In our PCA, we saw this fourth cluster come out that was comprised here at the bottom, you can see of about 98 or 99% of the, the things that had been identified as short nose. Um, but there's also a healthy bunch of um, things that were also identified as short jaw or Zenithicus in there. Uh, and so, and you can see that there's also some, some sort of intermediate things in there that seems to be a lot of Zenithicus. So, to sort of get a, a better feel of, of what falls within these major four major clusters that we see with genetics, we also did a quick um, DAPC. So if you can pop to the next slide, Owen. Yeah, and so before we do that, I just wanna point out one of the things that we've gotten questions about this particular slide, uh, Amanda, and this is, this, is not, this is not morphometrics. It's not the same data, even though it looks so similar. This is just the genetics in which we identify the morphometric identities by color coding the genetic that, data. So the, the amazing thing is, is how similar this looks to the morphometric data. In particular, as you pointed out, those we have Zenithicus that are, some are in short nose, some are in the middle, and some are in bloater, just as we saw in the morphometric. So just this is not, this is real. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point, Owen. Uh, yeah, the Although, only data that informs where a point falls on this plot is genetics data. The color of the dot is uh, what it was called um, with the morphological data. So that's, that's one thing to note. So, all right, next slide. 
so this is just another way of kind of looking at these data. Um, and this is a, a clustering method that, uh, again, uses only the genetic data. And if you only use the genetic data and see four clusters, here's where each individual or every bar on this uh, graph here, um, how they assign to whatever genetic cluster. And so this really is a, a kind of straightforward illustration of where things seem to um, fall pretty regularly um, and where things are um, a, a little bit more challenging to identify. So for example, um, everything at the top there is just sort of which genetic cluster, the yellow, red, blue, and orange, um, we would say something using the genetics data where we would say something belongs. So if there's a, a, a blue bar on that graph, we'd say it's Kai. Down at the bottom are things sorted by what they were morphologically ID'd as. Um, and so you can see that, you know, what they morphologically ID'd, for example, bloater, um, the vast majority of them, the genetics data said bloater. But if you look at the right side of the graph, there's a lot of yellow bars over there, things called short jaw um, within Kaya. Even a couple of Cisco um, came out for us as something that we would call with genetics bloater. Um, so it just kind of shows the, the challenges we face um, with trying to, you know, use morphology to identify something where the, the trait variation can, can overlap um, and be sometimes potentially very quite plastic. So I think um, we could probably pop to the next slide and I'll sort of continue my thoughts on here, I'll which just is just a return to that, that original that deep, PCA that we created. Yeah, that the deep bodied Cisco is clearly connected, grouped with the R to die. Uh, so that that didn't really come as any surprise, but again, it emphasizes what you just said. You could, even within Artadi, there's some pretty a wide range of morphological variation. You know, very different looking fish, but it winds up being the same, genetically the same form. Mm. So we are oh oh, and these are old slides. Those are old slides. They are. Oh. <laughs> Oh yeah, so this was this is based on that previous data set, and then we'll we'll move to another one. This just shows that first one where we did last time. I didn't know we were we're going to take that out. That was still in there, but <laughs> no. okay. But anyway, there's the bear with us, folks. We had merging PowerPoint slides yeah, here. This, this was just an analysis where Amanda added in these genetic data from archive say, scale samples of short jaws and short nose from Lake Michigan. And yes. This was do you the, have this was, Do you have my scale? Yes, I do. Let's go. To the but too. anyway, just to show, okay. this was the this is the the canon that was heard around the world. This particular figure, when you see the the two short nose from both lakes completely overlapping here. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's. Uh, we apologize for the uh, confusion there, but. Uh, to sort of follow on what, what Owen um, was talking about there is the reason why this was a little bit confusing to us is, or to me at least, was I have always read and been told that the most common rare form that still persists in Lake Superior is short jaw or Xenithicus. And we saw in that fourth cluster a bunch of Xenithicus. But using Keltz's characters, Owen was finding things that match very closely with what Keltz had described as short nose or Ryherdi. Ryherdi was never described from Lake Superior. It was described from Lake Michigan. So trying to understand what we see that there's this fourth cluster, there clearly is something persisting in Lake Superior, trying to go, okay, well, is it Ryherdi because Celts didn't describe Ryherdi from, from Superior. Um, but Xenithicus is supposedly still in Superior. Like maybe, maybe there's some you know, confusion or overlap. How can we tease this apart? And so there had been a, a sort of associated project with the GTC panel trying to see whether or not something we designed um, for contemporary samples could work on 
um, species in the complex that we don't have samples anymore for, could it distinguish them? So it's been trained and designed to tell apart what, what we currently have, that's very common. Um, but we have a fantastic archive at the USGS Great Lakes Science Center of scale samples going back hundreds and hundreds, well, not hundreds and hundreds, but hundreds of years, decades. Um, so we have samples from before the collapse in this, this archive. So you can see there's a, a black fin up in the top right here. It's a, a scale envelope from black fin from Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, that was collected in August of um, 1920. Uh, there's a box next to that for anybody who's familiar with sort of the history of Great Lakes scientists working on this species complex that uh, Carl Hubbs collected. Um, and that's back when it wasn't Corgonus, it was Lucy Ichthys. So it's a really, really fantastic resource. And because the method we switch to works on things that are degraded, um, it's the GTC panel is is a good thing to kind of test out and see what we can get out of it. So you can go to the next slide now, Owen. So this was a, a test run of those Lake Michigan scale samples that we were targeting. Um, and here is a, a gel just showing how degraded the DNA we were getting off these scales were for this project. Um, so here's a uh, short jaw, chi eye, and short nose from the 50s and 60s. Um, but if you see where the air is pointing in that gel photo on the right, um, those are target amplicons. So we're we're being we're able to get um, loci from the panel from these. And so if you go to the next slide, what we found is that a, a couple of really cool things. It's that one species that were extinct um, or extirpated um, in Lake Michigan. Uh, we could actually, that we didn't train the panel on, we could actually tell them apart. We could see discrete clustering with this data set that was designed to tell contemporary stuff apart. So that was really exciting. And then another exciting thing is that there were two subsets of, of samples included in this um, sort of preliminary analysis here that were contemporary samples from Lake Superior. And we were also finding that Lake Superior clustered with its species. It wasn't pulling apart from Lake Michigan um, and clustering separately. So with these data from this other project in hand, it's like, okay, well, what, what if we put, for sure, Zenithicus? What if we put Rhyherdi from Lake Michigan? What if we put some of the other deep water stuff in there and see how they compare to our contemporary superior samples that we have from this current project, what might those look like? Um, and could that give us a little bit of clarity with you know, some of the confusion and overlap we're seeing? So go to the next slide, Owen. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add a, a emphasize something you just said is that this diagram definitively shows how, like you said, the, the superior Michigan forms are clustering as forms not by lakes, and that's a profound uh, result. So I have a, a, a sort of PCA that I'm gonna sort of spin around and, and, and show you um, piecemeal so I can walk you around this. But the first thing to know is anything that's a bold colored dot on this PCA is a contemporary Lake Superior sample. So here's just to get, just to orient you, the yellow dots are these contemporary Lake Superior Cisco. Um, and we did not put a, a, a scale Michigan counterpart in there at all. Uh, we were mostly just interested in, in the, um, the, the deep water fishes. So, okay, you can go ahead to the next one, Owen. And this is just sort of rotating around. Here is the cluster of historic Michigan short jaw. Um, so they cluster very quite nicely out there um, off on their own. There isn't really anything from Lake Superior that is closely associating with historic Michigan short jaw. Next slide, Owen. We keep turning around. You can see here's um, our bloater cluster. Um, and you can see, so this, this is the same pattern we saw in the very preliminary PCA. Um, and what you see is the what is um, being called bloater, the red dots, 
are all mostly within that cluster, but there's a whole bunch of other things called other stuff. So there's blue dots. So some things that people called chi ended up genetically being bloater. There's a lot of that um, short jaw that is falling out with bloater. Um, so it's a little bit of a confetti cluster there where it seems like bloater might be an especially difficult species to identify with some of the morphological characters that are that are being used most commonly. But what you can see is right next to that cluster is the historic Lake Michigan um, bloater. So, and I, Dory, I see your hand up and I have a couple slides to go through, but if there, we can maybe potentially take a break um, before the end, I can, I can address whatever question you have. All right, so keep spinning, Owen. There's our kayak. So the dark ones are contemporary Kai. And what we notice typically is that Kai is much less misidentified. Um, it seems to have very strong character states that are used for identification that more or less, um, with, with a handful of exceptions, tend to get you um, a good ID. And then right next to those are Lake Michigan um, Kai. And then keep spinning, Owen. Here is the sort of joined cluster of what was called um, short nose and uh, the smattering of, of short jaw in there, very closely aligned with rye herd eye or short nose from Lake Michigan. And this is really what, you know, Owen was talking about previously was like, this is what was mind blowing to us is this is a species that we all assumed was extinct. Um, it was described from Lake Michigan. It's no longer found in Lake Michigan or Lake Huron or any of the other lakes. And so to find this, to see this, to see contemporary things morphologically keying out as, as rye herd eye and now having some genetic evidence that these things do appear to be rye herd eye, it's pretty mind blowing. So there's, there's one other, I think, um, slide of, of sort of just the video of this spinning. This, yeah, um, the, that we can go spinning, to the spinning top. <laughs> <laughs> the spinning top. <laughs> and before we had to get really creative to be able to. You can spin this very nicely in R. You cannot record that very nicely. So <laughs> some limitations. We, we, we did R. our best. So you know, one of the things as Amanda's talking is it, you might have noticed that the the the, the superimposition of clusters of Michigan and Superior Rigard eye are tighter than the other forms. I mean, so this is really a dead ringer in many ways, and that's why it's so amazing. Mm -hmm. So we'll go on to the spinning top. And there it, there it goes. So you can, just, yeah, if you if you watch it spin, you can see that those two right herd eye clusters are very closely associated with each other. But that very light sort of lavender pale purple is just not, not overlaying with a tight cluster of things that were called Zenithicus or short jaw um, in what is being contemporarily caught in Lake Superior. So anyway, it, that's that's it, it you, does, could, it does you could spin that for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, but Jory, that, did you have a specific question uh, that was associated with these PCAs before? Yeah, you know, I, I I think part of it has been answered and the spinning has helped some. Um I, I guess I would like validation on on an observation that I'm picking up here, which is you do have within lake, uh, among lake variation, like they're clustering by lake, even within a thread, but yes. that the lake clustering is superseded by the um, forms. Yes, exactly. Okay. So we can still actually see differences between the lakes, but the closest association is by species. Um, and so that's, if you, the more you add into a PCA, the more complex it becomes. And so if we were to limit this to uh, just two species, you would essentially see four clusters. You'd see the species split across um, the first principal component. Um, that's the largest amount of variance is going to split the two species that you've got in there. And then you would see the PC2 splitting apart um the the lakes from each other so then i have another related question which is it seems like you have and i and I, I guess you wouldn't expect in this short time period evolutionary you know progression but 
you do have a time thing here as well, right? Like, are these all from the same time period? Or because when you say historic, it's also like Michigan there. There's historic, a there's a mix you know? of them. Um, yeah. There's there's a mix of, of things here. So I I believe that the Kayai is from the 30s. Um, the Ryherdai is from I believe the 50s. Um, and can't remember about the bloater. So it, basically, what was included was anything from the 30s to the 60s in here. Okay, that not so not all of everything not that we've got has been included in here. So. And I think part of why you see um, the the sort of pull of the the chi -I scales is light blue scales towards the center is those are the oldest scales. Um, and for people who are familiar with PCAs, they do not handle missing data. You have to somehow permute data. Um, we use the average. So it will not create something that is more unique. It will just make it more similar. It pulls it towards the center of that PCA. So anything you see pulled towards the center core of this PCA is probably something that's missing more data than others. Mm -hmm. more, more degraded DNA. Yeah. More degraded DNA, missing more of the more of the loci of the panel, um, and so they're going to get pulled towards the center because those will get filled in with just general averages across the data set. Mm -hmm. So, and that also is a you know looking at this, the vast majority of the points are uh, pulled very much away from the center centroid of the of the of the graph. So they're it's actually a good indication that, that most of the samples have pretty decent mm -hmm. DNA. Yeah, and so this is just the, the sort of the what we have at the ready, what we have easily accessible for us to try and understand what this cluster was, what this means. Can we confidently say that a species that wasn't described from Lake Superior actually is in Lake Superior? Um, and, you know, the, the plan on the genetic side of things is I have an ongoing project to look at diversity with whole genome sequencing, which is much more comprehensive. Um, and so where I heard I and some of these rare forms will, will be included in that, and it will give you a much clearer picture than a panel that has 494 um, sites that you've amplified <laughs> um, when you're looking at the whole genome. And we also actually have relatedly a, a side project doing full genome work on, on scale samples as well. Um, so moving forward, we'll be able to really get a much clearer picture, but with the tools that we had readily accessible from projects that were, you know, had data that what we could use to try and understand what we're getting here. Um, I am pretty confident and comfortable in saying that, you know, it keys out morphologically by the characters of Ryherdai. It aligns very closely with the genotypes of Ryherdai. So pretty exciting. So we, we've either hypnotized everybody with the spinning diagram. <laughs> I know we should move to we should move on, I think. <laughs> we'll, we'll move to the let's keep going here. There we go. Um, so one of the questions that came up is, uh, that's related to this is what's the distribution in particular of the Riger dye that were collected from Lake Superior? And this is, um, Riger dye described by morpho morphology. Almost all of those wound up genetically being Riger dye. And so the, here we can see a lot of this is a, this distribution is a product of where the samples were available. So they could be in places where we have not indicated because we just don't have samples from those areas. But um, across the, the Canadian side, and um, all those samples on the Canadian side are courtesy of Tom Pratt and his uh, collections in the 2000s. And on the US side from samples that we were able to gather from um, a, a study that was uh, uh, sponsored by, funded by the Nature Conservancy down here by the, um, with Matt Herbert um, at uh, Grand Island, Michigan. So we were able to use those samples and then others that we had uh, from our trawl samples and things that were available in the freezers during COVID-19. 
And, you know, again, these would be, again, mor morphologically, we found Xenithicus, but we were calling morpholo morphologically, we're calling Xenithicus, um, are shown as shown here. And I should point out that the dots only represent locations, not individual fish. And just for contrast, just to give you a sense that uh, a lot of the kai are found offshore. Um, these are deep water fish, so they're not most of these fish are not um, in many places do not are not sympatric in that in particular most of the habitats with these other with with short jaws and xenificus and bloater so moving on to conclusions um, we have identified four morphologically and genetically distinct cisco forms in lake superior um, cisco bloater kai and short nose cisco um, and that last one, as we've been emphasizing, appears to be genetically identical to an extinct, the extinct form from Lake Michigan. The short jaw cisco and black fin cisco remain unresolved forms. Um, we will eventually get that nailed down, but they don't seem to stand out as uh, valid forms, uh, either morphologically or genetically. And one of the problems is that um, when following Kelts's um, his morphology, the, these forms tend to be always morphologically intermediate between two others. And that leads to problems as we found, it's very hard to actually figure out what they are. And the genetics bears up that uh, they aren't, they do not, they're not particularly unique either. either. So we're going to um, look more closely at some of these forms and get, have a better understanding. And you, if you recall the photographs that I showed you, I mean, some of these things that we're calling blackfin are pretty amazing looking ciscos, very different morphologically than anything we've seen, but the genetics doesn't seem to indicate that they're unique. So uh, we're not really sure what all that means. Um, that emphasizes the, the third point, there's considerable morphological variation in cisco forms. Um, could this be due to geographic uh, demic uh, population structure? And I point again to, just the example of the deep-bodied cisco, um, this rather strange looking um, form of artidae is an example of variation within a form, morphological variation. Um, so moving forward with increased sample sizes of rare forms and more detailed genetic analysis, we may have greater resolution of these forms and better understand their evolutionary origins. And that's gonna be the goal that uh, Amanda and I um, will be using moving forward. Um, what our goal will be, and I will go to the next slide is the next steps um, addressing those is um, we have a lot of data at, at our fingertips at this point. Um, and we're gonna use the genetic results to, to better inform and resolve the morphological conundrums with additional sampling, of course, is gonna be essential. Um, we're going to develop more refined descriptions of those rare forms. Again, we're going to go back and again, look at this again through Kelsey's eyes and our eyes and try to make some sense of the confusion as to what, what is going on here. Um, address those geographic trends in morphology and, and genetic variation. We've already started some of those analyses. Um, um, like, for example, looking at there's some variation in relative fin lengths within forms that we have discovered in our data, which verifies what we've been seeing through our own eyes working with different samples. Um, we want to address the effects of age and size or ontogeny of uh, the expression of morphology. And we've begun that. And um, there's, for, particularly with uh, Artidae, the amount of ontogenetic change in morphology is just absolutely astounding. I mean, this fish gets so large and it turns into something quite different. Even if it looks like the, the yearling does look like an artidae, the, a lot of the morphology changes as it gets bigger. Um, and we want to be able to develop a more useful key to allow discrimination of Cisco forms. And some of that's going to also address the ontog ontogeny of, of characters so that uh, we might be able to help people at least be able to better separate age one fish, which is is probably the most difficult of all. And, um, you know, we now have both of us, we have some newly funded research from GLRI. Uh, the first one is to do a genetic comparison of the rare forms using archive sa scale samples from Lakes Michigan and Superior. What Amanda showed you is comparing archive scale samples from Michigan with 
contemporary samples from Superior, we have a, a library of historic scale samples from Superior that we can look at and try to, we will look at to see if those match the contemporary ones um, and also whether uh, there's been any changes in, in, um, in, in the, for example, did, did Zenithicus exist at one time in Lake Superior and it disappeared? That, those kinds of questions can be raised. Um, and then we plan to do a, a, a contemporary lake-wide collection, which we initially wanted to do. So this will focus on those rare forms so we can increase the, the sample sizes and have very fresh DNA, um, non-degraded. Um, and that's always the goal here of this is to have the best uh, samples available. And then the other major project is to complete the construction of a relational database to serve future research. Um, that database is more than half completed, but it's a massive uh, undertaking to pull all of this data together um, so that um, future scientists can delve into this and continue to use the information that we have uncovered to help understand the diversity and, um, of these forms and um, perhaps help to guide restoration efforts in the future. Um, so I think that's the, go back. And Amanda, I've, I should stop and let you add some points here with a conclusion and the next steps as well. Um, <laughs> I, I was just gonna say, I kind of tacked him on to the end of my genetics section. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I, in, in addition to the, the newly funded research that Owen highlights here, where we'll be looking into Lake Superior archive scales for short jaw to see, you know, was that was it a thing? Even though right now it it, it seems to be a, a sort of point of confusion and um, lack of clarity. Um, maybe it was a thing and it it has been um, you know lost. So in addition to that, I have two ongoing projects, sort of looking at diversity and and looking at the historical impacts of this diversity collapse. Um, in the Great Lakes, and the the methods we're going to be using for those is um, different different types of whole genome sequencing, um, and so that's going to give us, I think, some really really nice evolution or evolution, um, really really nice uh, resolution on sort of the evolution of these different forms and where across the lakes they appear to have you know a shared ancestry. Um, because we know from, from ongoing work and new work that other lakes with a lot of diversity do not seem to share the same ancestral history of what we're seeing, at least in the upper Great Lakes. Um, so trying to understand the diversity, trying to understand what's there, um, using really much more extensive methods to better understand the, the nature of the diversity we see and the adaptation of those things to different niches. You know, and what we'll be doing with that, we're going to step back in time um, when this station was established in 57 uh, by, uh, with Bill, under Bill Dreyer's leadership. And one of the goals was to um, basically um, survey the diversity of Cisco's in Lake Superior. So Dreyer, had, I have at my hands, in my hands, correspondence between um, Dreyer and Hubs and Smith over these over these forms and how to tell them apart. So there was a, a, a much of an initiative to try to collect them um, for from the late 50s into the early 60s. And that collection is the basis for this historical uh, scale database that we have. So we're gonna revisit that, that period when they were trying to sort all this out. Yep. Yep, and there's there's also um, some very viable hypotheses that have been made that some of the deep water diversity that persists, for example, in Huron and Michigan, um, might actually be a hybrid of some of these deep water forms. As they were collapsing, there might have been hybridization because they saw large shifts in in some of the morphology, um, and whether that is something tied to to hybridization or whether that's something tied to a very rapidly shifting ecosystem um, isn't entirely clear yet. And so some of the work that we'll be doing will be looking through time um, to what we have now to see if we can identify um, some of those signatures of potential hybridization.
All right. Well, thank you very much, Amanda and Owen, for really great talk. It's nice that you had some time to kind of go off script. I know the JASM talk was like 12 minutes recorded. Um, you know, just Owen sharing, you know, Amanda's results, and it was nice to hear from both of you. So uh, thank you very much for sharing that. We already have a bunch of questions. I don't even have to ask the first question. Let's just get right to Peter. Hey, Amanda and Owen, that was really good. Um, I was wondering if you have, maybe you don't have genetic data and that morphometric data on the same fish, but have you combined those PCAs into, uh, I know there's some, you know, for assignment, you can do some things with like machine learning and other sort of clustering groups where you can combine morphological data with genetic data. Have you looked at whether, if you can combine those into the same sort of principal component type clustering and does that look like there's more resolution if so? That would be a very interesting thing to do. We have not done that yet, but um, it is something that I'm, I'm pretty sure, I have never actually combined genetic and morphological data, but I'm pretty sure Adagenet, make it, which is what we use for our PCAs, has a way of allowing you to combine multiple different types of data sets. Uh, so the one concern I would have for that is that there does appear to be very clear cut mis IDs in a certain number of specimens. And I'd be curious to see how that might impact. Sometimes it's just like two out of 45. Um, but sometimes if you look at like bloater, it's like, well, you know, <laughs> what, what does that do when a whole bunch of stuff um, that was ID to something else like Xenithicus um, is added in there. But but I think that would be a very interesting thing to just try and see see how it handles the data sets that we're working with. I, I think one of the ways that this comparing the two data sets becomes inf one informs the other, particularly genetics and forming morphometrics, is when you see a misID, I can go we can go back and say, okay, what may what what characters caused you to come to the conclusion it's this species when genetics says it's this other species? So that'll help you to identify which characters are causing the problem um, in driving this IDs. And that's part of the, the exercise that needs to be done. And I, you know, I think when you think of combining these two kinds of data sets, you get into a chicken and the egg argument. And I guess in my mind, I think genetics comes first. They, they really have to be. Genetics is going to drive the morphometrics um, one way or the other. And as Amanda said, we're, we at least we think we have better uh, confidence in our results of genetics than we do morphometric because we can make one mistake and then it, it's like a flip a switch. So it goes back to this other thing is when we have confirmation scores on these morphometrics, I could, you know, I'd be curious to see if there's a way to add, I think this has an X percent chance of being a a uh, chi you know, um, and how it sort of a, as a probabilistic kind of a thing can be done. Um, but it, this is the way we're doing it now, it causes, it has to be binary, plus either it is or it isn't, you know. And uh, so we can expect to see some glaring misidentifications that occur with the approach that we have. And Anne just answered in the comment that part of your question, Peter. Yeah, about these. Oh, yeah. There is that information for both. The same fish. So, uh, Ben. Sorry, I had to find my unmute button. Yeah. Um, so, we talk about this hybrid swarm in Lake Huron. Um, one of the things we saw in the Saginaw Bay Cisco population was this drastic transformation into these much smaller, leaner fish in the 1940s um, from what we saw in the 20s. Um, I'm wondering if there's any way to kind of you know, go in and obviously they were getting fished really, really heavily um, and either look at, you know, whether that's a shift to kind of a different genetic subset or a different hybridization um, later on in that time period induced by the fishery, or if that is strictly kind of an environmental situation that caused that uh, in Saginaw Bay. I mean, kind of off topic from the, you know, rare forms, but um, I think that would be an interesting project to look at later on down the road. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, as long as the samples are there, that's something that you could look at. And I think that these fish are, are very plastic. They speciated 
in a very, very short period of time. And we see massive morphological changes just taking them out of the wild and, and rearing them in a laboratory setting. Um, so especially with the head shape, just gets all sorts of fun. Um, and so, you know, we know that these characters under certain states can, can change. And we know that the characters overlap across many species. Um, so really trying to understand um, all the pressures that were acting on it and disentangling um, if they were acting in a way that would really drive a, a heavy amount of hybridization. Um, and that's been that's been documented in other corrigonines. So there have been some really fantastic papers that have come out of Europe um, looking at um, habitat degradation, driving hybridization and loss of, of a certain form. But you know, until you actually see that, until you see that that's how something acted on it, you know, it's it's hard to really say whether it was a, an adaptive change where the things on that edge of that, that character state's you know, distribution just ended up being wildly more successful or if those changes were driven by hybridization. Um, and so that's kind of our aim is to take, take this hypothesis out of being a hypothesis and try and better understand and see if we have evidence of hybridization. So what, I think one of the other aspects of that question, Ben, is, um, is ontogeny of character development um, you know, since these, um, these Cisco's tend to have rather episodic um, recruitment, um, you have to consider the relative age of the population that exists and the likelihood of what age, what stage of ont ontogenetic development you're looking at. Um, so for example, uh, we've kind of assumed that Gilraker counts remain relatively stable uh, that's not true with Cisco's with, by age, it changes. They continue to add gill rakers. So for example, if you were looking at an underfished Cisco population compared to one that's heavily fished and we have similar levels of, re of recruitment, um, you're going to see, or at least your class production anyway, um, you're gonna see an average, the, the un unfished population would likely have a higher uh, Gilraker count than the other one. And this is again just due to a difference in a relative ages of those stocks. Um, and so that's one of the things I think we're going to be able to answer in this um, analysis is how we can have sort of creep in some of these characters that are diagnostic between the forms. Uh, and I remember another one has to do with relative ice, the orbit, relative size of the orbit. And, I, and if I recall the initial analysis we did, it shows that as Kai get older and bigger, um, there's, there's, a, there's an increase in the relative size of the eye when you get to very old fish. So yeah, we have to be careful about what we're looking at. So that's another aspect of this research, I think can help us to sort of disentangle some of the conflicting outcomes or conclusions from looking at historical uh, trends in these in these uh, different Cisco's across the Great Lakes. Okay, we'll go to a question from Corey Brandt in the chat, wanting to know if there's any evidence that the short nose in Lake Superior are spring and early summer spawners as Kels described them in other lakes. Um, I guess I can answer that is, um, I've looked at, well, looking at the fish that we have, some of them would be, appear to be ripe and running in the summer and some not. We've also looked at some of the ones from the winter time and some of them look like they were spent. Some of them look like they had, were not even getting close to doing anything. So there may be differences within those populations. The other thing that we found is, I you saw in this, presentation, this thing called the cloud-based Cisco, which kind of looks like a bloater, but it's really big. Um, these fish were collected in the summer and they were ripe and running in the summer. So there's a, this care, this ability to shift a uh, period of reproduction seems to be not an uncommon thing in corrigonines. Uh, I know this uh, occurs in populate, sympatric populations of corrigonines in European lakes and has been studied. Um, of course, the question is, how on earth does a summer spawner actually make things work? Um, we don't have the answer to that, but 
that's what we're seeing. Um, so, and, and I cool. think we'll, we'll, we'll get more information on that if we do summer surveys, for example. Um, we haven't really done any uh, meaningful small mesh gillnet surveys in the summer for 30, 40 years. Um, so um, at the scale that we're, we're proposing. Yeah, very cool stuff. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Tom, as a follow up to the ontogeny answer you gave about the Saginaw Bay Cisco, wanting to know if ontogeny changes with size or age or both. Okay. Ontogeny, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a that clearly it does change with size, which is related to age. So it's going to depend on, so for example, Kai achieve more maturity at a smaller size. Um, but the other thing is, is we do have some examples of fish that are more than 20 years of age. Um, so we want to be careful not to lump those extremely older fish with younger adults because they, you know, by looking at them, they may appear to be different due to that indeterminate growth. So one hypothesis is that it appears that Kai I, um, do not get their head, their heads tend to get long, bigger or longer as they get older. So that the bone structure continues to lay down bone, but the length of the fish does not keep up with that. So um, that would be, I think we have enough samples to look at that phenomenon, which is an essentially age related beyond just size. Um, so the, that's one, another thing to be really careful in looking at this is you, it's not just simply size, but age. Uh, kicks in once the fish gets well beyond maturity. Okay. Hey, um, so Amanda, adding on those um, Zenithicus Lake Michigan historical ones, and then when you showed us nothing from Lake Superior contemporary was anywhere near that Lake Michigan Zenithicus cluster. None of the things that had been labeled like superior Zenithicus didn't show up there. That was pretty eye-opening to me. And I don't, I don't, was that, is that new that from this talk? It was so that the, the one slide we had a little bit of um, confusion over, uh, it was in there too. So the very first pass we did at this, like very hastily right before Jasm um, was the only Zenithicus and only Reichert eye scales. Um, it makes a cleaner PCA because <laughs> there's less there's less going on there. Um, but I thought that it was very it would be very helpful to show people that like species and species associate with each other. There is, as Jory pointed out, like you see, like here's Superior, here's Michigan, and there might be a tiny bit of overlap, but mostly like that you still see that that lake difference. Um, but I, I didn't want the rye herd eye to be the only example, and so we included more in this one. Um, so we did see that in the original JASM talk, we see it repeated here, um, where, because uh, my thought was, you know, okay, if this is Reichardai, maybe that central cluster in that, that first PCA that we ran, um, where there was some sort of in, in the center there, maybe, maybe that's where, you know, the, the short jaw is genotyping. Um, and there's just mis-IDs in, in, in bloater mostly and some other places. Um, but that is not where the Michigan short jaw came out. So I think it will be really, really interesting. The from the survey that Owen and I did in putting together the proposal for the the funding we received to to dig deeper into the historical um, uh, assemblage of Lake Superior. The the vast majority of rare forms, the scales that we have, are for what was called Zenithicus. So that I think is going to be really interesting to, to look in is to genotype all those and go, okay, <laughs> you know, where do those fall? Do we have anything creating a, a nice cluster next to those or somewhere else more discreetly um, that, that shows that yes, Zenithicus was a thing in Lake Superior and maybe it's just not anymore. Exactly. It'd be exciting to see those results when they come out. Hmm. Other questions from folks?
I've been sort of thinking about short jaw and short nose and the fact that they uniquely clustered in Lake Michigan and the fact that you see differences, Owen, today and with some characteristics, mostly it sounds like a little bit with the head shape, a little bit with the gill rakers, but yet they don't really separate out cleanly like they apparently did in Lake Michigan. And the fact that Celts didn't describe them in Lake Superior, even though he clearly saw the uniqueness between them in Michigan. So I, I just, this is to Owen or anybody on the call, Tom or others that know more than me about this, but what could have made those short jaw and short nose unique niches historically? And why would they have arisen only in Lake Michigan and Huron and not in Lake Superior, for example. I would think the habitat in Lake Superior is just as diverse and rich and even you know deeper, deeper water. Like it's just a, I, I can't really figure out a, a good explanation in my head why um, we didn't see that short jaw and short nose potentially. Why we weren't why we're not seeing that in Superior or, or didn't describe it in Superior historically. And that's a good question, and I think. You have to assume that since you had all the other forms and their closest relatives from Michigan, where what on, what on earth happened to the Zenithicus? It, it's not there, um, and that's a. And it goes back to that other question: is what what really dis, what's the real difference between those two forms? Um, um, you know, they they can be distinguished, but um, you know, part of this would be is it that. Um, I'll have to see what differences, if there are any differences, deep, small details in Kelts' descriptions of the Michigan form of Zenithicus versus what we were seeing in Lake Superior, what he described in Lake Superior. Um, so, I, I mean, it's, again, this is, like I said at the beginning, we have to always, it's going backwards and forwards, going back to Kelts and looking at this once again through his eyes and what he was seeing at that time. And, you know, realize having, having respect for that, um, not, not dismissing any of that because, you know, we, we need to incorporate that understanding with our current situation that we have now. And only then we'll be able to understand how it's, why it's different today. Um, I think that's, and really a good question. It's the same kind of thing I've thought about is, is it, is it possible that, that what was being called Zenithicus here was Rygerdi all along? Um, you know, and again, I think we're going to address that question as well. Amanda, did you wanna, did you have any thoughts on that or? If not, that's okay. Nothing, nothing super profound, really, other than historically by what was described, sort of the heart of the diversity was in those two lung lobes in Huron in Michigan. Um, and because of what we're seeing with the genetics that, you know, the species themselves in those upper Great Lakes um, seem to have a shared ancestry. Um, it's, it'd be curious to see, like, you know, I, I don't know if we could backtrack where they ended up speciating likely at some point during deglaciation, there was a lot more connection between all of those lakes and that's probably where they ended up spilling over and, and you know, um, hmm. moving into those, those available niches. So, but I think Owen brought up a good point, which is there's a lot of stuff that was called um, Zenithicus in Lake Superior. And I think it will be really interesting to see does it appear to actually, if we can genotype it, does it appear to be Xenithicus or is it Riherdi? And I think the biggest question would be if it all or mostly comes out as Riherdi, what, <laughs> what does that mean for Xenithicus? <laughs> you know, does that, does that mean that it was just another, because correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't the Xenithicus that uh, was described in Lake Superior was like a sub, a subspecies of Xenithicus or am I wrong in that? Um, well, the type locality is from Mission, from Lake Superior. Is it okay? Yeah, it's all. It's not far from east of Duluth. Okay. Um, at least that's morphologically, but you know, that that uh, that would be interesting to 
that's that adds another level would, of interest. <laughs> in, okay, so how would. Would you it was a period it, of great and then splitting. It's not even time, there. I would say. And it, the same thing you <laughs> described there is actually genetically distinct in Michigan. So, just adds to another level of confusion here. Ben. This is probably a question more for Owen. Um, Lake Superior is kind of a big place. And a lot of times when I see those presence absence dots there, um, you know, where did Kelt sample? Um, did he get a very good spatial distribution? Is this a situation where he could have just potentially missed pockets here and there? Um, I mean, is, is that something that's a possibility? I mean, I've read through it, but I don't, you know, necessarily know where all the sampling locations are. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, considering what he was dealing with, his coverage is pretty decent. Um, you know, his technique was to basically tag along with commercial fishermen and sort of give himself, employ himself as a, as a, a fishing hand. And then in exchange, can we set some nets uh, at this place and that place so that he could collect fish? Um, and so that also meant that he didn't get out in the middle of the lake. And also he was kind of stuck with the meshes that the fishermen were using, which tended to be like two and a half or two and five eighths inch. So that, as I pointed out, this may explain why he never saw much in the way of uh, kai -ai, uh, because that kind of mesh is very poor at uh, catching kai -ai. Um, So kai -ai was, we, I suspect was far more abundant than he thought it was just because of the fishing gear he was limited to using. But and he also it would tend his fishing gear would tend to select for larger chubs um, if they're there, and so um, I, that's a good question, Ben. And I, it, it's possible to get the answer to that by carefully going through his records and marking down, you know, systematically all the different locations. I know I have he's given descriptions for a lot of virtually everything, and I've used that to actually locate one, a number of his sampling sites back in the early 2000s. The one I thought was most interesting was the one in, uh, in, in Whitefish Bay off Iroquois Point. And he gave a bearing and a distance, so many hours at such and such. And kind of figuring that out with our Captain Joe Walters. And we figured out, well, it's right here. There's this sort of buried escarpment that runs out of north, northeast to southwest direction through the middle Whitefish Bay, and I'll bet it's right at the bottom of that. And um, that was in early 2000. We dropped the bottom trawl there and uh, pulled up a couple of short jaw ciscos in the first haul. I mean, big, big fish. Um, <laughs> it's just pretty exciting to say, like, oh, well, Kelt is right. I mean, he just gave us directions from 100 years ago. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's that would be a, a good exercise. And I, I think I may have done some of that in a publication in the in the mid in the 2000s when I compared um, some diagrams just showing locations of where he caught things um, that's not the same thing as saying or show me all of the locations that you've sampled um, but I, I think I may have essentially have done that in one way or the other okay I just quickly looked at one of the other ways that we can I mean, we talked about morphology and genetics. And so trophic information also is a way to think about the niche. Um, we'll hear more about that next month from um, Jory and, and Ben. But I looked at uh, Blanky or Blank, I'm not sure how you say Chelsea's name, uh, Blanky et al. 2018, which uses this amino acid specific form of the historic Lake Superior and Lake Michigan, deepwater Cisco's. And when you look at them in the historic Lake Michigan, it was um, short nose and short jaw, very close together at the bottom, sort of at that isotopic level. So again, like they seem to be very similar, um, even in that sort of isotopic analysis. Um, so just adding more sort of what makes them unique, what makes them different is that that doesn't help us with that puzzle that much. And then, you know, just following up on that, Bo, is we're, uh, we're engaged in a collaborative study with Ben Martin, PhD student at uh, Madison, to look at stable isotopes of these fish for which we have described morphologically and genetically. 
um, but he's also interested in the things we couldn't figure out because um, they might be different ecologically, you know, and that yeah. again, it might get, it give you some into, you know, add some, another dimension of, you know, what's going on, how these fish may be genetically similar, but in basically utilizing different niches. Yeah. Yep. From what I think a lot of the, the work that's happening now is showing, it seems to be very driven by eyesight. There's a lot of fantastic work out of Trevor Cabinhoff's lab showing that, you know, there's, when you get to deep water, deep, deep water forms like high eye, there's, you know, a, a fixed um, state for a, a vision gene. And then when you look at Owen's data for those gill rakers, like those rye herd eye gill rakers just were outliers compared to the other members of the complex. So, you know, I think definitely like depth and definitely the, the, like trophic niche that they're exploiting is going to be really interesting. And the the flexibility of the trophic niche is a real, a real interesting one, just because of all the fun stuff they're seeing with the, the Cisco's and Grand Travers now becoming Piscivorous. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's going to be some really fantastic research that will sort of help inform, you know, what caused these things to become separate species what might be causing them to <laughs> converge back and, and reverse speciate um, based on all of the ecological changes that have happened in the lakes over the last hundred years. So nice uh, chat there from Tom Pratt. One thing I always wonder is what forms we didn't see because we weren't looking for them the past 40 years when Agrippinus, Cyanopterus, Cyanopterus, and Rigardi, Diamond Eye were synonymized out of the lake. It's great that Owen started looking for them again. So, what what goes with that? And 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 Tom's collections are in the same way. We were we were told that they're all the same, but I kept saying, but they're different. <laughs> but we're collecting them anyway and taking pictures of them, and and then building on that, realizing there was more for more diversity than we were led to believe. We didn't understand it, and we're still in the midst of trying to understand that. Twenty years, twenty years later, we're beginning. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've been in process on this, and it just gets to be a more amazing story as we go forward. All right. Well, thanks to the forty-five of you that hung on with us for over an hour and a half. That's pretty awesome. Um, thanks again for a great talk. And everybody have a happy holiday season. And January 6th is when we return. Um, so any last minute thoughts before we sign off? All right, thank you all very much.